from where I'm located today. So we'll get started. As I said, everyone, good morning or good afternoon. This is Alan Schimmel of DevOps.com, and welcome to another of our continuing series of webinars. Today's webinar is uh, sponsored by Evident IO, a company we've worked with now for a, at least a year and made up of some folks that I know pretty well from my security days. We're very lucky to be joined by the CEO of Evident IO. Tim Prendergast, and a friend of mine from the security world for many years, uh, Mr. David Mortman. Today's webinar is a Security Fundamentals for DevOps Shops, and I think it's going, we hope you'll find it as interesting as we do, but I guess we'll see. Uh, why don't we move to the next slide? And as I said earlier, uh, I am Alan Schimmel, Dave Mortman. Uh, actually just recently left Dell Software. He's also a contributing analyst at Securosis, and you can read that for the rest of yourself. Tim is a friend of mine who's CEO and founder of uh, Evident IO. And prior to that, Tim kind of led the charge in moving Adobe securely to the cloud. And uh, this led several other technology teams prior. And I enjoy talking with Tim and Dave. They're two of the brightest people I, I work with in the, in the cloud security and DevOps space. So that being said, Tim, Dave, just a quick sound check, making sure you guys are there and, and everything's working. Uh, while not fully caffeinated, I am fully awake and uh, ready to go. So this is Tim with Evident IO, and uh, like Alan had said before, excited to be here and talk with everyone. And uh, let's check and see if Dave's with us. Thanks, Tim. Alan, I am here and ready to go. Okay. All right. The way we're going to do this one's a little different than I've done other webinars in the past for those of you who, who've listened. We're going to do this more in a sort of panel format, tackling the subjects, uh, subject matter of each slide and go from there. So our first, our first kind of topic today is identify your allies, right? And this is really, you know, DevOps, people sometimes scoff at the idea of DevOps being a cultural element as much as tools or anything else, but it's it's 100% true. And DevOps is not a solo uh, endeavor. You do need to build a team, and, and that team must buy into the shared vision. And in building that team, and, and this goes for security or anything else around DevOps, you need to find out who your allies are, uh, both from the top down, from the bottom up, and from the middle out. And if you don't have your allies identified and, and pulling in the same direction of you, it's very hard to make DevOps work and to do anything with a DevOps security mindset. Tim, your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, I think, you know, a lot of organizations right now are either kind of transitioning into a more mature DevOps model or just getting started on their move to being more agile. And they're learning that it's not that you can just go create a team of five people, call them DevOps engineers, and have a successful transformation of your business. It's really changing the mindset that a lot of people have throughout the organization and getting one to buy in. And so you might have, you know, the owner of the line of business having to see the value in this agile business, uh, being able to deliver and get feedback from customers more quickly. You have to have the engineers believe in these CI, CD for continuous integration, continuous deployment cycles of, of delivering code to the to the customers and an agile form of operations where you really change from what used to be kind of like batch delivery of software into this continuous almost real time uh, engagement that operations seem to have to do today. I think what happened in a lot of organizations is we were all so eager to move to this new model and reap the business rewards that security got kind of left in the dust and we've all been so uh, sensible in finding the business allies that once we got the product out and we got our customers onboarding, we really forgot about a lot of the needs of security, risk aversion, compliance, these things that always come later and kind of are the, the downer at the party, right? And by finding not only your allies in the business, but finding the security allies that, that go with your organization's uh, needs, you end up being a lot more successful because you include them earlier in, earlier in the effort and they contribute towards this transition and they contribute towards the success of uh, the DevOps movement philosophies that you bring into an organization. And that's something that, that a lot of people are just now starting to learn and we've really seen as a motif over 
the last half of 2015 and moving into 2016. Uh, I mean, Dave, what do you think on that? What's your experience been? What have you seen from people you've worked with? That's, you know, that's great. I mean, I think I really agree with, uh, in general, with what you said. I think one thing uh, that we sort of left off this slide is it's not just a question of identifying allies, but in a lot of cases, it's it's actually, you know, creating those allies. You know, it's reaching out to folks uh, and, and building that relationship. It's not, you know, in a lot of cases, there are folks who would be perfectly willing to be allies, uh, but you have to find them, and you have to sort of um, cultivate that relationship just like you would within a team. You need to build, a, you know, break down those silos and, and reach across the aisle, so to speak. If uh, to abuse a political metaphor way too much, um, yep. and I, the way I like to frame it when talking to folks is that it's time we start uh, acting like the adults that we actually are. Yeah. I, you know, guys, I think that's even more true in fruit when it comes to security within the DevOps mindset and pattern, right? You know, you say, oh, we're going to be doing a DevOps. You know, we're going to do approach things from a DevOps point of view, and immediately the ops, the devs are reaching out across the aisle to use uh, Dave's, you know, metaphor, reaching out across the aisle to the ops, and the ops are willing to, you know, are looking forward to engaging with the devs, and and making all that happen. And as Tim mentioned, too often, the security guy, oh yeah, what about that other guy that's outside the room? You know, it's important and. It's important to engage the security folks early on as well, but it's equally important for the security folks not to be standoffish, right? The same way the ops are eager to engage with the devs, the security people sh should be eager to engage with the ops and dev team and not just say, oh, I'm skeptical about this, right? You're going to have to show me I'm from Missouri. I I've heard that way too many times from security people, and that's not, that's not a way to make friends and influence people. You know, Alan, you touched something really key I want to touch on before we sure, move forward, and that was in security we've been sitting in these patterns for 20 years about how we do things, and we've trained security professionals. Literally, there are certifications that say be averse to risk and change. Change is the enemy of stability and security, right? And we've had to rethink that paradigm for these very cloud-centric environments that make the DevOps organizations really hum where they're, you know, dynamically and idempotently spinning up resources and tearing down things. Uh, that fear of change often comes from two things. The first one being kind of a lack of understanding of uh, why we want to move to this agile practice and what the benefits are for the organization because you know everyone's going the same direction in the end. And the second thing is the lack of effective tooling and solutions available in the security industry because we were very fortunate in DevOps that we had you know, great companies like Chef and Puppet and some of these really forward thinkers uh, help enable this movement with the infrastructure as code component. Uh, security until recently has really struggled to, to latch onto that and believe in it. And we're seeing a big dynamic shift in the security market, which is great for everybody. Uh, but up until now, it was always very standoffish. So, uh, you know, everything we talk about, it, one of the most critical things is that people aspect. We're finding the security people in your organization and helping them embrace the same DevOps mentality and philosophies uh, is one of the keys to being successful in the long term. Agreed. Agreed. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide though because I I can see that David, Tim, and I can sit. We could have talked about this one for an hour. Uh, but ne next up is kind of understand your value to attackers, right? And how many times, David, I know you have, and Tim, I know you have, you, you speak to companies who say, yeah, we have, we, we're not a target. We have nothing they want to steal. We don't keep credit card data here, right? And so we're, we're, and we're too small, and we, we're not in New York or San Francisco or London or some big city. And um, they, don't, they don't look at it as how a, an attacker or a, you know, a bad guy looks at their company. And... Guys, I'll let you talk about it a little bit. I, I have some thoughts on it. Dave, I'll let you go first. I jumped oh, in first. I mean, in the end, well, sure. I mean, I think in the end, I mean, this isn't a pure uh, DevOps issue per se, it's, but other than everyone sort of coming together and understanding what the larger uh, world looks like. Uh, but in the end, you know, someone, you know, there's always resources. Compute resources are always handy, whether it's for you know, launching uh, distributed denial of service attacks or 
command and control centers for botnets or anything else, there's always something there that someone's going to want. And part of that's identifying it. And it just depends on, uh, as one of my panelists said in back channel, we sell cat food. Who would attack us? Well, people who have a lot of cats, maybe. Maybe there's someone out there who just really likes cat food. I don't know. Um, but the idea is to figure out what is the value to the company and you know what would the executives at your company be be really distressed if it were to be found on the internet or that was to be you know or process was to be subverted. Yeah. I think you know, one interesting thing is we always obsess on monetary value like oh I don't have credit card information or personal things that they can sell on the dark nets and, and sometimes your value to an attacker is I mean for lack of a better term the notch on the bedpost or something on their, their underground resume saying uh, you know we're the ones who brought down so and so dot com, or we're the ones who defaced this organization, or you know, and we've seen, unfortunately, in this cloud era, some organizations be totally wiped off the face of the planet uh, by a malicious attacker that we don't understand the motivation for. So, trying to rationalize what attackers want or want to do is sometimes difficult. I think really understanding what do we have that would be valuable, our brand, our reputation, uh, our social media accounts, our compute resources in the cloud, you have to look holistically at everything and understand how they can be used in a malicious way. So you kind of put the devil's advocate, uh, you know, little hat on yourself and go through the exercise so that you can better understand how someone would proceed to trying to take those things from you and then build your defenses around that in a very iterative way. Security, just like you're building your infrastructure's code and config management, it's all going to be an iterative process for every organization and just like the traditional engineering side, it doesn't stop because you've released a product. It's an ongoing effort that you're going to be working in. Absolutely. Right. I, I'll just end this. Uh, Go ahead, Dave. I think I'm contractually required, uh, it's still 2015, to reference uh, Sony and point out that one of the big embarrassing things that happened was not them losing IP uh, or, or losing content, but the fact that internal emails referring to actor salaries and the attitudes they were taking towards salary negotiations and whatnot got leaked. And that caused them a lot more embarrassment than just about anything else. I'll just end it with one thing. There was a little HVAC uh, contractor who also thought that his stuff was invaluable and why did he have to do security? But unfortunately, he, he was, he was a, a provider to Target. And, and he became the, the venue or the, the, uh, the way into Target for you know, we talk about famous breaches. So it's not only who you are, but it's who you who you're with and, and who they're with and so on and so on. That being said, let's let's move on to our next slide. So yeah, so like you know one of the things that's great is you know, how do you really understand what your value is or how do you take action, say we have this database, it's a really most valuable thing. How we protect it, you flip the script around and you say we're going to red team ourselves, right? We're going to attack our own infrastructure with all this intimate knowledge we have of it and find all the possible ways that we can disrupt, uh, you know, pillage or destroy, you know, our valuable assets. And by participating in these exercises, which, by the way, once again, are an ongoing thing and not a one-time thing, they give you some really good insight into the ways that attackers may, who, by the way, have months or, or even potentially years to investigate, sniff around, and find a path in, uh, it gives you an understanding of, of what they're going to be up against and lets you instrument and set little tripwires and alarms for yourself and, and really do a better job of protecting yourself and your customers' interests. Dave? No, absolutely. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I agree here. Again, I know you're shocked at this point that Tim and I are doing a lot of things, but uh, I, mean, I think this is where things like, uh, like threat modeling come in handy is the ability to, to game out what, uh, what options look like, what attacker, what, you know, what routes attackers might take. And the great thing about tools like threat modeling is that it really enables you to start this process at the architecture level long before you write any code uh, and, to, and carry that through your entire process to deployment, to production use and ensure that you are approaching the right threats with the right level of, uh, of caution. Yeah. I, let me pose a question on this to both uh, David and Tim. So, you know, Red Team, and, and for those on our, on our webinar who may not understand what a Red Team is, 
you know, these are teams designated to do very this, to attack themselves, you know, internally, to attack companies' own stuff. And by attack, it's more probe and find out, you know, doing penetration tests, social engineering, and, and other activities. But how do you how do you grow this cultural axiom, if you will, outside of just the security company? How do we get the DevOps teams, the devs, the ops, the QA, how do we get the rest of the organization involved in this kind of inflective, you know, way of, of attack yourself, of looking, you know, that you find the hole before someone else does? Tim or Dave, any thoughts? Dave? Oh, I, I always have thoughts. Um, I think the thing that has worked, <laughs> I always have thoughts. Uh, the thing that I have found that works well in the past is to, when, when approaching developers and ops folks, is to frame this as a general quality problem. I have yet to meet a developer who likes writing bad code or a, an ops person who likes deploying, poorly deploying technology. I mean, it's sort of, you know, in the nature to want to do the best job possible. And this is a, you know, and doing this sort of, you know, attacking yourself first, threat modeling, trying to break things mentality is something that is very attractive to people who like things to be done the right way the first time, uh, because it helps them identify ways things can break. It's sort of a matter of pride, if, if nothing else, to do it as, as well as possible. And frankly, no, I'll, I'll jump in and share. So we did these at Adobe. We stole a page out of Netflix's book and called them kind of a chaos monkey exercise in a way um, where we would get all the development teams together. We brought in, we were in distributed offices too, brought in pizza and drinks and made a big, like, fun thing out of it. And we had everyone literally predict what would happen under various scenarios, uh, almost like a betting pool in a way. So we made it a very gamified, right? Um, and then after we went through the first one, I got this slew of emails like, this was great, this is one of the most fun things we've done. And Dave's exactly right. You treat it like a quality exercise. We're going to make this more robust. We're going to make things better. We're going to help you really understand your failure scenarios across both operations and security. And then it becomes part of their DNA. <clears throat> one of the things, like, you know, the same thing that happened with the DevOps movement. If you can get people to buy in and believe on this, you know, what I firmly believe is that over time, we're going to continue to, you know, technical people kind of scatter to the wind from, from great companies of various, you know, have a great exits or IPOs or fizzle or whatnot. But they take these efforts with them, these things they learn that are really good patterns, and they bring them to other organizations, and eventually you end with a movement. And it creates a great opportunity where we're basically raising the game of all the organizations out there by showing everyone the value in doing this. And that's a fun thing, and it's not like, a traditional compliance audit, which is kind of like pulling teeth. Yep, agreed, agreed. Um, you know, before we jump to the next slide, I just want, I see our first questions are coming in. I know some people joined perhaps after we, we started. There is a, a question section within the GoToWebinar control panel. You can ask your questions, type them in there at any time. We've set aside time for the questions and we'll, we will get to them. So feel free, otherwise don't trust yourself to forget it later. Anyway, um, guys, let's let's jump to the next slide, and that would be defining your battlefield, right? And, and Tim, do you want to talk a little bit about what we mean by that? Yeah, you know, the thing that's great, and, and one of the challenges of security is we always have these models and these frameworks that we work off of, and everyone thinks that those are the gold standard. Really what's happening is we give a baseline, and then every organization has to customize these things around what their actual needs are and their unique constraints and requirements, right? A bank in Germany will have very different requirements than uh, a mobile app startup in San Francisco Bay Area. So you have to kind of sit down and a little bit articulate what's normal for you. When do we do deployments? You know, what kinds of things do we use? What don't we use as far as, so let's take Amazon Web Services, for example. We don't use the giant GPU instances. We only ever use medium size, high memory, high CPU kind of processing boxes. So I can very clearly say, if I ever see a bunch of big GPU boxes spun up in the middle of the night, I know that's not my team doing legitimate work. That's some kind of security incident or something happening. By defining what your battlefield looks like and defining the rules of war at, from which your organization operates, it makes it very easy to start doing things like automating test cases to validate that not only is your infrastructure properly up and running, 
but that your security policies and rules are all in place and are in the good state at all times. And if they're not, uh, then we'll talk about it in the next kind of slide, but if they're not, you're very aware of that. Excellent. David, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, I think, you know, what, what Tim said here was, you know, I th what I would call, you know, doing a baselining exercise is you, before you, you know, you really need to understand what your, what your environments look like so you can identify uh, when things get out of, uh, out of scope, if you will. Uh, you know, the, a, a big principle within DevOps is, uh, so J uh, John Willis is a big fan of saying that, you know, Edward Deming is the, uh, is the patron saint of DevOps. And uh, a big thing that, that Deming came up with was that uh, unexpected variation is unacceptable. And, uh, and what we're talking about here is where are we seeing variation in the environment that is uh, unexpected? We're always going to have a bit of variation. Systems are not going to always perform exactly the same, but there's a range of things that we expect to be happening. And by, doing a, uh, by monitoring constantly, you can start to identify environments uh, that are out of, uh, out of scope and outside the normal realm, whether that's, uh, like Tim said, certain types of instances uh, spinning up, or machines suddenly using a lot more CPU, or uh, fan speeds going faster, or power consumption changing. It doesn't have to, you know, things like that are just outside the norm. Suddenly, start giving ideas that something might be wrong. Uh, whether it, it could be network traffic spiking or dropping off, those are both indications that something different is happening and uh, worthy of looking into. It might be a security incident or it might just be a non-security related bug, or it could be something else entirely. Makes sense. Tim, any last words on that? No, I think that the last word comes next, which is um, you're setting the stage for this automation acceptance, right? And, and people will often say like, you know, security and DevOps, I'm having a hard time seeing them go together. Well, this is the slide that, that kind of helps you put the picture together, and it's really, you know, by doing your automated, you know, smoke testing and things after a deployment, you have your CI/CD pipeline. Jenkins rolls out this whole new, you know, deployment. You run all your tests. Why not put your automated security validations in that process? Why not every time, as part of a deployment process in the software lifecycle, validate that security is properly implemented, is representing your corporate policy effectively? and actually becoming an enabler to move you faster through uh, this agile software development life cycle as opposed to being that thing where you stop all development for two weeks because the security guy shows up with his giant 500 question Excel spreadsheet. Um, those questions are meant, you know, that, that process is meant to make sure that all the guardrails are in place so you can go really fast. And if you can automate a lot of those guardrails, which we've seen a lot of organizations successfully do, and we've helped a lot of organizations do, you're able to build a lot of confidence in moving and pushing the limit even faster. Some organizations will deploy once a month, some will deploy every two weeks, some will deploy 50 times a day. The difference between those organizations is the level of confidence that they have in how fast they can properly assess the quality and reliability and security of their code as it goes out to the customers. I don't know any organization that wouldn't deploy every hour if they could generate real value and deliver real quality in doing so, uh, security will be one of the key components in accelerating this for a lot of organizations going forward. So Dave, I don't know your feelings on it, but um, my, my Damon Edwards and I were talking a couple of weeks ago at the DevOps Enterprise Summit about RSA and security and so forth and uh, RSA conference. And he said, you know, we, we need to tell these security people that going faster is safer, that going faster can make you more secure. And, uh, you know, in listening to Tim talk, I, I think that's part of the message here, that automating these tests rather than showing up with the 500 questions spreadsheet is a lot, will, will result in much better security. And um, just, Dave, your thoughts? No, absolutely. Um, there's been actually some great research on on this on this very topic, uh, dating back uh, that was done by IBM Research back in 1979, that found that as the feature complexity of an application increases, 
the code complexity of that application increases exponentially. And so the cool thing about this is that if you do a little basic algebra, what you find is that a series of small feature changes drastically creates less code than, a, than a, just a couple of large changes. And you know, so if you and so when you think about this, this is basically what continuous build, continuous integration, and eventually continuous deployment gets you: is a series of small changes. Uh, when the changes are smaller, that means fewer lines of code. When there's fewer lines of code, the chances of there being a bug in that in that section of code are smaller. The chances of that bug being, if there is a bug, the chances of that bug being critical are smaller. And if there happens to be a bug, even a critical one, the ability to roll that back out is significantly higher. So the ability to either roll that bug that code out or hot switch to the old code base gets easier. And it's also much easier to identify where problems are. Now the great thing about this is this is not just a security issue, this is a general quality issue. It means that if someone you know checks in 20 lines of code and you run the build against it and you run your integration tests, you can say, oh look these two tests broke on these lines of code that David submitted. And then I, and I get the report within minutes or hours of having submitted the code while I'm still clear on what I was thinking when I wrote that code. And so then it makes it it's faster uh, chance to respond and correct the issue uh, in a reasonable fashion as opposed to trying to do this with say 50,000 lines of code that was checked in over the course of the last several months. Yep. Tim? Thoughts on this slide before we move on? Yeah, you know, I think I think what David was really drilling towards becomes, uh, you know, the the faster feedback, which is something that we all love as part of this natural iterative DevOps cycle that we get into, uh, coming in the form of security, right to the people who are responsible for changing the code and the infrastructure and those those things, really eliminates a lot of friction. It doesn't have to go up to the ivory tower where you know the security people have been sent off to. And then come back with you know a nasty email or something like that. It's it's a very conducive, natural feeling for uh, people developing software that you can say, you know, just like a, a functional test fails, a security test can fail, and give me the feedback I need to make another check in and restart the whole process. And that one will likely pass. Or if it doesn't, I'll have the same kind of feedback cycle. But this iterative development, uh, like Dave says. Uh, really just really just makes things safer, cleaner, and faster for organizations and, and gets them in a position where they're able to respond at a rate that they've never been able to respond to before. Excellent. All right, let's move along. So this is all, you know in the same lines, right? What we were a little bit of long in terms of what we were talking about, and that is embracing continuous security. David, you haven't gone first for a while. Why don't you set the stage on this one, and Tim and I will clean up. I mean, so, I mean, we, we sort of were already you know here on the continuous security piece, but the idea of having security tests built right in means that you get that faster feedback loop that you're constantly testing not just the general quality of things but the security of things. Uh, in fact, uh, with a uh, previous company that I was uh, I worked with, they had a bunch of, they actually, they had a requirement that if as an engineer you were submitting code, you had to submit unit tests to go with that code. And if you didn't submit unit tests to go with the code, your code wasn't checked into the repository. And so we, we took that concept and extended it and require and started having the developers adding security unit tests and on at least uh, one or two occasions we ended up identifying security issues not in our own product as a result of the security integration tests but security uh, issues in uh, products we were integrating with because integration tests started failing and as we started poking at things we realized that it was actually the partner's code that we were breaking inadvertently. And so we ended up having to do a full security incident response process with the vendor. So that was kind of fun. Tim, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, I I agree with David that we kind of touched this a bit, and we call it out just because we have to be specific. There's a shift in the industry from what we call stimulated security, which was 
while erotic sounding, not that exciting. It was really, you know, someone sits down at a console, some expensive security product, and we click a button and we wait for hours and we get some kind of result back. And then we have to parse as humans that result and make decisions based on it. And the problem with that in these DevOps environments where continuous deployment and continuous iterative development is happening is that if you deploy 50 times a day, the chances of you being able to wait eight hours for a security, you know, automated security scan to complete and give you a report means that report's already out of date. So by bringing this from an external process to be part natively of the of the DevOps, you know, automated deployment process, we get into this like DevSecOps style pattern or rugged DevOps or whatever you really want to call it. Um, we've really sexied it up with some cool names, uh, but it's really about making security just another step in that you know DevOps cycle. So it's not this off to the left process that requires. Uh, human brokering and discussions and arguments over, you know, if this report's current, where this machine go, um, and these highly transient environments that we create in the cloud nowadays, you almost have to be uh, as fast as the deployment process because resources can live for minutes, hours, days. But they're not living for months and years like traditional servers and and data centers did, and so that change has really stimulated the security industry to have to rethink how we approach understanding what assets are where, how they're configured, how the security policies are associated to them, relationships, all this dynamic moving parts, and do it in a really rapid way so the DevOps teams can really understand their environment from multiple contexts and act on the feedback that they get from the systems in place. Absolutely. I, I, I don't want to belabor the point, but I, I would just quickly add on this subject that Continuous security doesn't exist in a continuous vacuum, right? If you're not doing things like continuous deployment and continuous integration, continuous monitoring, continuous testing, the idea that you're going to do continuous security is just a little bit silly. And so again, one, you know, once again, security has to be built into the overall, you know, the overarching model of, of what you're doing of, and how you're doing it. You, you can't just say, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do continuous security," without, without the rest of the, you know, matching your worldview and, and the way you operate things. But um, let's go on to our next slide. Invest in security solutions with API. You know, I'm just gonna go real first. I think everything should have an API security solution or not, but. Dave or Tim, who wants to go first on this one? Dave? Oh, I'll go with this one. Um, you know, in this sort of modern DevOps cloudy world, as far as I'm concerned, if it doesn't have an API and it's a service, well, it doesn't exist. It's not really a service if I can't programmatically talk to it. And so it just has to be. It has to have an API. Uh, everything is, everything has to be automatable. Galileo famously said, measure all that is measurable and that which is not measurable, make measurable. And, you know, sort of jumping back a bit to the continuous security slide, we need to automate everything that can be automatable and that which we can't automate, we need to make automatable, which means APIs because we need to, we only have so many people and so much resources, so we need to be able to free up the people to work on the problems, the hard problems that we can't automate. And the secret to all of this is is APIs. Yep. I think you know what's what's key to take away from here, and like we could have just left the slide and not even talked about it, and I think everyone would just nod their head, yes. I think just understanding that everyone on this planet wants you to live inside their pane of glass, and we've seen this across every DevOps tool and security tool, and, and it's not necessarily all you have to do is have technologies that have open data models that tie together that allow you to operate as effectively as possible like David said without scaling bodies because that's the last thing that I think every DevOps organization on the planet uh, is going to be able to do. Now a lot of people think having a bunch of people solves a lot of problems but really uh, having a, a core group of really savvy people that are automating things gets ten times more done than having a, a giant team continue to try and scale intelligently the tribal knowledge and the expertise. Eventually you run out of people that are qualified and we've seen this in the security space 
starting years ago where there's a shortage of, of talent. And with the scale of, of startups and companies that are embracing DevOps, we're going to see all the DevOps experts joining us on this webinar and that we meet in the industry uh, all being locked up in great jobs and a, a shortage or a glut of experienced professionals that can do a lot of these things. So automate, automate, automate. The only way to do it is with the API. We have to say this about security solutions because you would be startled as at how many do not have an API whatsoever and, and call themselves like a, a modern security solution. It's just, you know, you, you all are responsible for holding the bar much higher and making this industry move a little bit forward uh, behind some of the thought leaders out there. Fair enough. Let's move on because we've got to worry about time, as always. Um, opera, operationalize your alarms. Tim, why don't you take the lead on this one? Yeah, so we've kind of built to this point where no matter, you know, you're automating, you're testing, you're, you get all this data out the back end of all this automation and understanding of your infrastructure, and then it's like, what do you do with it? If it just goes into a big, you know, log collection system and, and nothing ever happens, and you only look at it retroactively in case you had a security incident, it's pretty much a waste of everyone's time and it's useless data, right? What you want to do is proactively be able to respond to things. And so you want things that tie into the tools you already know and love. If you're using Splunk and you want events going into Splunk where you have aggregated all of your infrastructure uh, data together so you can alert off of an aggregate pool of data, right? A holistic view. If you want to have certain events trigger pager duty to the on call to make sure someone responds to things like security incidents. That's a huge critical thing you have to decide and, and build in. You can't just assume that someone's going to log in, like I said, look at the pane of glass for every tool you own and make the right decisions. It's all about getting that data into the hands of the people who can make the change and repair or remediate the, the issue that's occurred. And it's probably the most critical piece of an operational organization's uh, structure. Dave, what do you have to say about this one? No, absolutely. Uh, you know, otherwise, all you end, if you don't actually look at your data either manually or with some sort of automated process, then all you end up with is a big data black hole. It's, it's not even a lake, it's just this big drain, you know, in the middle of the floor that everything just goes down and you never look at it, and, you know, unless maybe you get notified that you had a breach. And so, you know, this is where, you know, alerting and not just monitoring, you know, comes in handy, is you can start identifying conditions in which uh, you expect, you know, unexpected things happen. That's, you know, the anomalies are where things are interesting. So, you know, you know, send me an alert when a firewall changes between midnight and 6 a.m. Yep. And uh, I know, like, if you guys are into blogs, Etsy has some great blogs, the, the craft uh, company has some really great blogs their team has done on studying alarm thresholds and on calls and things. And they've openly shared that. I'd encourage everyone to read it because it really helps you understand what kind of things are really critical to alert on and what are kind of things that can wait till morning and those kinds of things. So, For sure. And uh, one thing that's also interesting is to figure out what conditions do you expect to happen and alert when they don't. Yep. So, for instance, you know, if you expect, you know, on Friday evenings that sales are that you know sales of whatever widgets are going to go up, or if you, if you're Netflix, you expect that you know Friday evenings that uh, viewing is going to go up or down or whatever. When something different happens than that, that might be indicative of a problem, and so uh, that's an opportunity to alert as well. Yeah, absolutely. Guys, we're going to move on to the next panel if we can. Man. So I'll, I'll jump in on this one, Alan. I think. Go ahead. Oh, you want to say something? No, no. I, you know, I'm, I'm you excited on this it. topic. Okay. So I'm diving in. Um, security is not something you plug in. Security is is an aggregate of solutions and technology, practices, operational behaviors, and you build a, a, a this awesome cake out of it, right? And if you guys love cake the way I love cake. You get something with six or seven layers with all kinds of fillings in it. It's one of the most decadent things you can ever enjoy, and security is no different. Uh, build your defenses across multiple technologies and multiple assumptions and multiple views, and you create this holistic approach that, that creates a better level of risk aversion and protection for your organization than putting all your eggs into one basket and assuming, like, hey, I threw all my stuff you know, in a data center and cut the internet off, and it's totally safe. 
and I never have to worry about security again. Uh, that's not a reality, and anyone that sells you that reality is, you know, a bit of a shyster. Uh, what the real answer from professionals like Dave and I is is that uh, you have to be thoughtful in constructing that that layer cake of your security and operational model, and then you know do some taste testing periodically. They go back to these red team exercises. Always look to improve parts of it. Get more telemetry data from different parts of it. And it, it goes back to security. It's iterative and part of the DevOps process. You're always going to be investing here. There's no one-time investment you can make that's going to solve your problems. Yeah. David, do you want to say something before I do? No, I mean, I think this is a uh, – okay, I lied. I do have something to say. Um, you know, I, th I think the layer cake approach is uh, definitely uh, – is definitely the, the the way to go. I think uh, security solutions are often sold, you know, as a more of a cupcake or a, or a whoopie pie, if you will, rather, or you know, as opposed to a a more complex uh, structure that uh, it really needs to be. Yeah. And with that, I mean, I'll let you uh, jump on there, Alan. Yeah. No, I mean, David, I know you were a long, a long time, right? And Tim, we know each other a while. What amazes me is, I, you know, I've been talking about information security since two thousand and one. And I, I think I was doing, I don't know if we called them webinars then, but I was doing stuff like this, talking to people and talking about layered security and why you need defense in depth and why you need, you can't put all your eggs in one basket. And what's amazing is we didn't have the cloud then, or maybe we didn't call it the cloud, but whether you're in a data center or you're in the cloud or you're on just your own devices at home, if you don't have a defense in depth, a layered strategy around your security you're negligent right and you're at, and and when things happen to you you kind of deserve it so this is to me this is a constant right that just doesn't change and you know i it just you know here we are 2015 and we're still talking why you should do layered security if it hasn't sunk in you know I, I can't emphasize it enough. That being said, though, we, we need to move along. Let's okay. jump on our next slide. This one's a, this one's a great one. I'm going I'm to give one sentence on this, and that's we spelled community wrong. Um, no, actually, the, the, the sentence is, uh, go spell check. No, the sentence is, uh, security has had a history of keeping things so close to chest and not sharing dirty secrets that it's never been able to progress the industry forward as fast as what happened on the infrastructure side with the DevOps community. We love being part of and encouraging people to share your security advancements and successes and your failings in the community the same way that we do, you know, the, the great new way we can deploy things in an automated fashion or whatnot. Uh, it makes the whole community better. It makes all this arrogant group of defenders out there on the planet trying to, to keep companies safe, have an advantage over attackers. We're not being picked off like sheep at the back of the herd anymore. So if you get a chance and you do something cool, please shout it from the rooftops. Please consider sharing things via GitHub and, and really encourage your peers to do the same so we have a great open security discussion going forward from 2015 because historically we haven't been able to have that conversation and we've all sorely suffered because of it. Absolutely. David? Tim said it quite well. Uh, you know, John. To reference John Willis again, he gave a series of uh, DevOps days talks where he would talk about his concept of DevOps, which was CAMS, which is culture, automation, measurement, and sharing. And we certainly covered the the first three earlier uh, in uh, this webinar. And this, I think, this is a big one. It's not just about sharing between teams within an organization about what worked and didn't work, but also, like Tim said, giving back to the community, sharing the, those lessons. Uh, both because it helps everyone to learn uh, what mistakes to avoid or issues that come up, but also it uh, it really helps uh, remove the stigma of being human and making mistakes. And there's a whole – we don't really have time to get into the full blameless post-mortem thing, uh, but it's I think that's a hugely important part of, uh, of the sharing is – having the ability to comfortably say what's going on without having to worry about uh, being crucified for making a mistake. Absolutely. And, and guys, I, let me, if, if you don't mind, I'm going to kind of wrap this one up on, on the slide. And that is, when we talk about sharing, you know, it's not just about sharing security team to security team, red team to blue team, 
but really it, it goes to the heart and essence of DevOps, which is sharing with the entire organization or, or anyone who wants to partake in that sharing and, and making, making us all better, making the organization, and not only the organization, but the communi community, the commune city, as, as that slide says, it's making the whole, the best practices of our industry better. And, and this really goes to the heart of why we do webinars like this. It's, it's about tribal sharing. You know, the security tribe and the DevOps tribes need to come together and, and share more information on a more regular basis. I'll give a quick plug at RSA conference this year on Monday of RSA week. We're going to be doing a uh, DevOps Connect rugged DevOps session all day Monday in a thousand seat room. And I invite anyone who's going to RSA to doesn't cost anything extra. Pop in on Monday and spend the day with us. Dave, you spoke there yesterday uh, last year. Tim, I I know Evan and I O actually sponsored last year. So come to that. Um, speaking of plugs, I, I also put into the chat session a URL um, for our next webinar on DevOps and security, which again we're doing in partnership with uh, with uh, Evan and I O. Tim, I know you're on that one as well. Uh, the link the link is in chat for you guys. You can register right now. Tim, we have another great special guest on, on that one, though, don't we? Yeah, we do. I believe we're having Andrew Storms joining us, who is yeah. uh, a very vocal and uh, someone who's had a lot of thought leadership displayed and shared to community around uh, DevOps and security and putting these things together. And it's it's great when you get you know, people from different backgrounds and different companies and, and we all come to the same conclusion and it's exciting to, to get us together so we can tell you all how we got from zero to 60 miles an hour and all the bumps in the road along the way so that people don't have to make those same mistakes and they can learn from all the hard work and, and the pain that we've gone through along the way. Absolutely. Save the idiot taxes. Um, and, and Storms is a great guy. I, I'm, I know Andrew as long as I know Dave, I think. I mean, it, it's great to see all of these security people now starting to embrace this DevOps mentality of, of, of how we should get things done. That being said, though, let, let's move right into questions because uh, we've got a bunch of them here. And um, ooh, here's a great one. Huh. Can you recommend a great tool to test web apps from Millie? Tim, Dave, what would you like to recommend? I'll let Dave jump in first on this one. Um, there, that's a great question. Um, on the commercial side of things, I can highly recommend both Veracode and White Hat. They do a great job uh, on that side of things. There's a number of open source solutions that are going to be uh, highly variable depending on what exactly uh, your application looks like. Uh, but but, but you're, there's some great uh, check out on the open source side of things, Gauntlet. Um, that's a great tool, and then if your if your application is Java based, uh, there's Find Bugs, which is a general Java security tool that uh, security quality sorry Java quality checking tool that happens to have some security testing, and on the Ruby side of things, there's Breakman from the, the folks at Twitter. Excellent. Yep. And 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 my my contribution, you guys will find this not as bizarre. White Hat for app scanning. We also uh, I always used a, a dual provider solution for web app scanning, so I would run OWASP Zap to make sure that uh, you're hitting all your OWASP top 10. Uh, White Hat, which usually will cover the OWASP stuff also, and Tinfoil Security is another fairly commodity DevOps center kind of app scanning technology. And then as you move down into the secure software development lifecycle, uh, I can't say enough good things about Veracode for both stat static code analysis and dynamic code analysis. Uh, if you go talk to the most prolific, uh, publicly speaking, about their secure software development lifecycle, Kind of organizations, Veracode is the constant I've seen across pretty much all of them as the as the tool of choice. So, hopefully that helps. Great. Next question is: We mentioned the database is a resource that need that we need to secure. How do you secure the scripts the developers ship as part of development? In other words, how do you check that changes that included in the scripts are the changes that should be, and not a backdoor which is not documented? And that's from Yuri. So Tim, you're, this, is, this is Tim with Evident. I'm going to jump in first on this one, David. So I can tell you, you know, we're a security company building security technology for other companies. Every piece of code goes through peer review. And so one of the ways we built our organization was to make sure that 
not only is there peer review, so there's joint understanding. No one's got a single point of failure as far as if that engineer gets hit by a bus, that code's lost to the to the tribal knowledge, right? Um, our engineers can cross check each other not only for quality but for, for performance and optimization. They can learn from each other based on different skill levels. But there's the security cross check that happens also uh, to prevent that exact situation from happening: a disgruntled employee from slipping something in. And then uh, you actually have uh, you know white hat, not white hat company, but like white hat like meaning you know looking at the code, security testing done as part of your life cycle and part of your continuous security process where you may have internal engineers that review the code for security issues or run code scanners or all these kinds of things against it uh, to protect your organization from something like that happening. Excellent. Um, our next question is how would you handle applications or operating systems which no longer meet compliance? In other words, end of life support. That is a great question. There's there's a couple of options. Uh, one is to move on. Just you know, so not, and if if you can, you know, move switch applications or operating systems to something that is supported. Uh, other times, uh, what you need to go with is a comp is alternate alternative compensating controls. So, if you have to say an old finance application, you need to keep available for a certain number of years, and it's no longer within compliance. You know, seg you can segment that off on a on a on a separate network. Uh, alternately, you could virtualize it as well, and then only spin it up when necessary. Uh, I know a number of organizations have turned to third parties for because they need support, say Windows XP, for a limited period of time. So there's you know third parties that are providing software solutions to layer on security for those environments as well. Excellent. The key takeaway from David's statement there was basically uh, compensating controls are available for everything. There's always an exception to the rule. You just have to ask. Yep. Next, what is the difference between DevOps security versus security when servers and services that are in a data center? Security has always been a continuous thought process. So let me, if, if guys don't mind, I'm going to take the first crack at this one. So. Guys, anyone who tells you that DevOps has to be done only in the cloud, to use Tim's word earlier, is a shyster, right? DevOps, DevOps can take place wherever you're doing Dev and Ops and NIT. It takes place at the data center. The cloud enables a lot of DevOps kind of functionality in terms of automation and, and, and so forth. But DevOps takes place at data centers as well. And Yes, security has always been a continuous thought process, but there's a difference between moving from what you have in your brain or mind to actually implementing and, and, and doing it that way. So I, I would say while security folks like to think that we've always been sort of continuously thinking about security, and we have, building security into a continuous cycle as part of dev and deployment is is uh, still the goal. David, Tim, any thoughts? So I'll give a quick one. Like, well, I'll start off by saying. I'll... Oh, sorry, Dave. Go ahead. I was going to say, I think that uh, saying that security people are always doing continuous thinking is uh, self-flattering uh, at best. A lot of folks, and I've certainly been guilty of this in the past as well. You know, certainly get stuck on a certain way of thinking about things or. Uh, or how to solve a problem and being convinced it's the only right way to do it, which is sort of the anti-DevOps, uh, if anything, is the is to be a, a, a sort of implicit part of DevOps is the willingness to change and to uh, rethink how things need uh, need to uh, happen. Tim? And so, go ahead. Go ahead, Tim. Uh, I think you guys just kind of stole the show on that one. I don't have any uh, great value to add there. Just drop the mic. Um, yeah. Okay, next question from Justin. How safe is saving your source code in GitHub? Woo. Tim, you want to comment? Yeah, well, uh, it, it's as safe as, as the security controls you implement like anything else, right? So um, is GitHub a company that could be compromised? Yes, like every other company on the planet. Is GitHub um, fairly committed to security? I believe absolutely from all my interactions with them. I think that... Uh, if you're not careful, it's easy to have things like publicly viewable repos and things like that happen. Uh, there's check boxes almost in a way. Um, 
it is one of those things that you know it, it's bitten some companies where keys have been out there and lost and and used maliciously. Uh, so basically, long story short, you have the responsibility to protect the source code in any external service. Be the external service be ADP or Workday or GitHub or whatnot. There's great valuable data in all of those. Make sure your controls are all in place and stay that way. Uh, and if you're concerned. There are great alternatives like GitLab and other things for running, you know, GitHub basically internally inside your enterprise. And at, over time, as you mature and you run into regulatory uh, or compliance challenges, a lot of companies turn that way just for the sheer sake of uh, guaranteed control around, you know, where source code lives and if it leaves the company. And I'll tell you, nine out of ten times, the person making that decision ends up being the general counsel. Uh, for the organization basically saying at this point you know legally our best obligation is to keep stuff in-house and not out of house because it creates a nightmare if there's ever a litigation scenario for them okay our next uh, question we only have a few more but it's good because we only have two minutes what security solutions can be added to the uh, continuous integration continuous delivery pipeline so that with a check-in communication build or post deploy integration test we can get immediate security results. White Hat leaves a bit to be desired there. Tim? Yeah, I think a, a lot of this, like, you know, uh, Arachne is a really good um, uh, web app scanner that's open source, A-R-A-C-H-N-I, I believe. Um, it's one we actually use and tie into the back end of a CI-CD cycle uh, in an effort to provide a shameless plug for ourselves. Uh, the evidence security platform was built with an open API and data model, so people uh, tie us to the back end of like Jenkins and things like that for uh, security audit of deployed infrastructure in the cloud. Um, when we talk about looking at solutions that have APIs, look at that from the perspective of can we take this API and like on a post commit hook or at the end of a Jenkins deploy, poke it and get a result back to help us make the next decision in the chain. And if that answer is yes, it's probably something worth you experimenting and playing with to verify that uh, it gives you the, the data that you want. Um, the open source stuff tends to be easier to do it with because uh, it's built in a more modular, open model fashion than some of the longer-lived commercial products like White Hat or Qualys or some of those. So, absolutely, guys, we, we've got time for only one more question. I'm going to ask Jules to grab the rest of the questions, and Tim and Dave will send them to you in writing, and we'll try to post written answers to the remaining questions when we post the uh, the uh, recording and slides from today's webinar in about 24 to 48 hours on, on DevOps.com. And before we get to the last question, again, just a reminder, November 18th, just a couple weeks away, is our next webinar. And again, kindly sponsored by Evan NIO. And I will be there joined with Andrew Storms and, and Tim, who's here today with us. And we're going to be talking about security automation, something we touched on today. So please take the time, go register now for that because uh, we do have a, a limited seating on, on how many people can join in at one time. So registering now will guarantee you being able to join us. Um, that being said, last question. You mentioned many good app scanning tools. How about external perimeter scanning? Would you include Nessus? David? Uh, well, I'm biased. Uh, due to the fact that I'm on the advisory board for Qualys, so I probably should not actually answer that question. So you can say you can say Qualys, which which by the way uh, is is great for that. I think Nessus is another great one. Um, I think you know end mapping your perimeter, you know, also another great one. Showed or those guys did a great job with that that solution. So uh, there's a lot of good ones out there. Like I said before, use more than one. A lot of them are free or low cost. Uh, all of them touch the TCP stack a little differently and, and judge flags differently. So you should definitely, uh, you know, mesh together the results and verify. I've seen one report that they fingerprinted the Solaris box running in the cloud, and, and that gave me a good chuckle. And I've seen one completely miss that box as having open ports. So uh, never trust that one's perfect. And once again, like defense in depth, have uh, have security intelligence in depth as well because it's not as costly as it used to be. Excellent. Um, Solaris box in the cloud. Hmm. Anyway, we're going to call a wrap here because we are out of time and I do respect everyone's busy and has work to get back to. David Mortman, it's always a pleasure to participate in anything with you. So thank you so much for joining us today. 
Tim Prendergast. Thank you for having me. You guys are killing it at Evident IO, and don't ever be ashamed to make a shameless plug for what you guys do. You do great work. Thank you. And um, everyone who stayed here to the end, thank you so much. This is Alan Schimmel for DevOps.com, and we look forward to seeing you on our next DevOps.com webinar. Thank you, everyone.